Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you all so much for being here. Really excited to see so many faces. And for those of you joining us online, thank you for joining us. My name is Cecily Cullen, and I'm the director and curator here at the Center for Visual Arts. And I'm also the current chair of the Colorado Committee for the National Museum of Women in the Arts. I'll tell you a little bit more about the committee um, in a minute. But um, I would like to start by offering an acknowledgement of the space that we're currently occupying. The CBA acknowledges the privilege we have to gather in this place. <clears throat> Once the territories and homelands of so many indigenous people, including the Arapaho and Cheyenne nations, both of whom were subject to genocide and forcibly removed from this land. We respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to this land, and we value the knowledge systems they have developed in relationship to their lands. We understand that offering a land acknowledgement neither absolves settler colonial privilege nor diminishes colonial structures of violence, either at the individual or institutional level. Land acknowledgements must be accompanied with ongoing commitments to displaced indigenous communities to learn more about the spatial relationships of indigenous communities to lands. Visit native-land.ca. So if you haven't been here before, I'm just going to give you a little bit of history about CBA. We are the off-campus gallery for MSU Denver, and as a branch of the university, we extend the MSU mission into the community. We do that by provoking dialogue about challenging issues of our day, locally and globally, through the lens of contemporary art. We believe strongly that art is a crucial form of communication that allows multiple entries to talk about social justice in ways that other forms of communication do not. CBA also works to provide access to vital art and experiences without a financial barrier to participate. That's why admission at CBA is always free. And that is why we always pay our interns, whether they're high school interns or college. And that's why we always pay artists to participate in exhibitions. So I hope that you find this exhibition and this evening's program worth supporting. And sorry, I do have <laughs> some notes to read. Um, so I hope that you'll sign up for our mailing list, stay in our orbit, and if you are able, consider making a donation or becoming a member so that we can continue to welcome everyone in for free. So you may have heard that this was the summer of women. In pop culture, at least, it was clear that the cultural contributions of women made a significant impact on the economy. But like Greta Gerwig's film pointed out, anyone who thinks that sexism is over is living in a fantasy or a Barbie world maybe. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is that despite some important gains, parity is still out of reach for women in the art world. Gender plays an outsized role in who gets representation in museums, major galleries and auction sales. When you factor in, intersectionality, such as race and sexual identity, the disparity is even more stark. To demonstrate that, I just wanna share a little bit about the Burns and Halpern report that came out in December, 2022. Um, they can, uh, these two women, Charlotte Burns and Julia Halpern, have conducted large surveys three times of American museums and the gold, uh, global art auctions. In the latest report, they found that between 2008 and 2020, only 11% of museum acquisitions were of work by female identifying artists. And only 0.5% were by Black American women. Auctions were no better. Um, only 3.3% of work by female identifying artists were sold at auction, and 0.1% were black American women. So as much as we like to see celebrations like this, this exhibition, the reality is that we're still far behind and we're generations behind. Um, it, they estimate that we won't have parity for another 30 years. <laughs> An important part of that conversation 
around equity, um, CVA has, has mounted another exhibition in our student run gallery behind me. Um, the 965 Student Cur Curated Gallery currently features an exhibition titled Fluid State that examines and expands on the constructs of gender and identity. Our student curator, Christy Zaragoza, organized this exhibition in response to Colorado Women to Watch. I hope you have a moment to check it out. It's really a great show. So now on to Colorado Women to Watch. This exhibition is a celebration and an entreaty, demanding that the world pay attention to and support female identifying artists. Kim Dickey, Ana Maria Hernando, Maya Ruth Lee, Suchitra Matai, and Senga Nangudi each have created a visual language that is poetic and transcendent. Their work is complex, intelligent, and powerful. Their achievements, despite barriers, are inspiring. And they've each been nominated for inclusion in an exhibition in Washington, D.C. at the National Museum of Women in the Arts. That museum works to balance the scale of opportunity and equity by bringing national recognition to female identifying artists, and they invite committees from around the world to nominate artists for consideration. The Colorado Committee for the National Museum of Women in the Arts was founded by nine women to ensure that female identifying artists from Colorado are recognized and supported at a national level. The committee had the great honor of working with Nora Burnett Abrams, the Mark G. Falcone director of MCA Denver. Um, Nora selected the five nominees. So many thanks to Nora for her leadership in selecting these amazing artists and to my colleagues on the Colorado committee for their great work on behalf of women in the arts. Before I pass the mic over to Nora, I just want to say thank you to the staff at CBA. They are small and mighty staff and they're incredible and they do amazing work and spent all day setting up this talk and getting it prepared for the online environment. So thank you all of you. I'm honored to work with you. And I also want to thank the CBA Leadership Council, our advocacy board, that helps bring um, new people into the fold and helps us uh, build our fundraising. So thank you to all of you as well. And with that, I am pleased to introduce Nora Burnett Abrams, the Mark G. Falcone Director of MCA Denver. Thank you. How about that? How about this? Um, I want to start by certainly thanking Cecily and her team for organizing and inviting us all to be here tonight. Um, I have to say that it's been such, and I don't get to say this as often as I would like, it has been such a fun experience to work with all of these incredible women and creative um, and creatively ambitious artists um, to continue to learn from and be inspired by and be provoked by your work and just you as human beings. So, and Suchitra, of course, um, is wrapped in all of this as well. So I wanna just say first and foremost, thank you. Um, I had a whole list of questions that I had prepared and sent to Cecily last week that I wanted to um, kind of use to, to anchor our conversation together. And then I read um, a review of this show in the Denver Post and it really kind of like, I don't know, it pricked me a little bit. Um, and, <laughs> and I'm sure some other people here as well. Um, and so I wasn't gonna lead with this, but I just feel like it's so, it's really on my mind, um, which is um, the extent to which all of you artists um, are thinking through your work as women, as female identifying, um, and to what extent that is a useful and productive and generative lens for you or not. Um, and really where I hope to kind of um, take the conversation is to what extent do you find that there is still a need for kind of gender-based 
um, uh, organize as the organizing principle gender based um, exhibitions such as this one, or are we kind of in a moment where perhaps that's no longer um, a, a useful construct? And I, I open it up to all of you, whoever wants to respond. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Is this working? Oh. Hi. <laughs> Is this working? <laughs> Uh, so after I read the article, I was thinking about it. And of course, you know, for all of us, for me, I, my work is so much about the feminine. And, and I do, you know, in all of the things I do in my work, it's because I'm curious and I want to learn as a person and uh, I guess that's how I made my work to learn more about these things. And I read the article and I think it's it's so wonderful that we can talk about these things and what it means. And gender is something that has opened uh, in a very open way more and more where I think all of us, we are asking about who we are, how we are, and the article, I think it's very valid in that way. And at the same time, I was thinking about the creation of the National Museum of Women in the Arts that was in the 80s, and thinking, first I thought, oh, museums, men's museums? And then I thought, my God, there are thousands and thousands of men's museums. <laughs> so even though I think the proposition would be wonderful that at some point we don't need to talk about this imbalance, it still, it irks us. We are living it in politics. We are living it in so many messages that are uh, under so much of what we read and everywhere. So um, I need the feminine in all of us. I need the feminine in whatever gender you want to say you are, because I think historically, we have been so unbalanced in that way. And I think it's why also we are suffering uh, a lot of the damages of climate change, of people suffering where not all of us have been taken into account. So in that way, I think it's a very important conversation to have. How can we bring more balance in that? And hopefully one day there will not be women to watch <laughs> shows. <laughs> so I don't know, anyone else? Okay. Um, first of all, ditto. <laughs> and uh, I really uh, found the article important in you that. Your... Oh, just hold it closer to your to your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it's really important to have an article like that so that we have um, something to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> you know and uh, we can gauge where we are in the moment. And um, it's really easy for um, the male gaze not to gaze on us uh, uh, equally. And I agree with you with everything you said about that. And, um, you know, it feels like fun going out with girlfriends to lunch. <laughs> and it feels like fun, you know, talking about stuff. And and so um, there's a, a positive energy that goes along with um, uh, 
the female culture. And um, I'm just really happy that he wrote that article. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can talk about it and flesh all this stuff out and see what's really real right now. No, you can keep that. I think I have one. There's another mic right there. That's just for us. <laughs> okay. Is this on? How do you turn this on? It's on. Good. I want to agree with both of you. <laughs> this is going to be one of those panels. We're all going to like be nodding. Um, I think that the the article was helpful in the way in which it illustrated exactly the point um, that we don't have parity, uh, that we have a long way to go. I wish I think I think like everyone here, I think we all wish we were in a different place and that um, exhibitions in which um, that were defined by a gender because that gender is historically underserved wouldn't be the case, but it is. Um, it's clearly um, even worse, I'd say, in our culture now than it's been when I was younger. So um, sadly, we definitely need this. Um, and I, I think also this is a wonderful celebration to Anna's point uh, and Senga's point of, of the, what contribution we all do have and the female can bring to the table. Um, and I love as an artist to work from that place and multiple places all at the same time, like uh, not just uh, my female identity, but my mother identity, my teacher identity, my um, New Yorker identity, my Colorado identity, whatever it is that um, feels I'm in con conversation with. Um, and uh, they can all be celebrated. Um, at the same time, I, I think a lot of the work that I've done has also been interested in a kind of um, place of uh, beyond gender or sort of genderless freedom to not be to be released from from that constraint or de I, uh, definition um, and find um, a space that somehow is is um, universal. So that's also something that comes up when I think about this. Thank you. Um, for me, you know, article or not, I'm just really honored to be showing you. Um, and, you know, just you're all artists that I've really looked up to. Sangha, I've studied you for a really long time, even when I was living in Korea. And for me, it was just such an honor to be here in the space with you. So for me, article or not, I'm just happy to be here. And I think that's really the point, right? That, you know, oftentimes with group exhibitions, you know, there's a through line or there's a connector, or there's an organizing principle um, that allows us to draw connections across bodies of work, across different practices, et cetera. And I, what I appreciated um, about Ray's review was just that it's, you know, listen, it's a provocation and, um, and, and he loves to do that and I get that. I think the um, bittersweet aspect of something like that is just that it shows still yet how, how far we are from being at a place where we can really um, recognize gender as a spectrum in all aspects to on this point in all aspects of kind of the environment or context that we're in. And, and I think we can all agree we're probably not there. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm a part of a museum directors group and every year when we get together, there's still a women directors subgroup subcommittee, even though a majority of the museum directors are women and female identifying we still need to meet together because there's still a lot of inequities in our field. And, um, and I, I share that only as an example of how I think opportunities like this can be really, um, again, productive and exciting because it can show how incredibly diverse the practices of these five artists are. And yes, they happen to be women. And yes, some of them are exploring gender specific ideas or, or um, uh, questions, issues, um, and some are not. And 
all of that is a part of the conversation. And I think that's where we want to get to is a place where gender is or may not be a part of the conversation with regards to each of your practices. Um, but it's on your terms that you're setting that up, right? That it's not on, on others. So with that being said, I, I think what is so wonderful about the way that this has been organized and curated is that each artist seems to have like their own kind of area. And yet because of the cross lines and views and um, the way that it's set up, there are a lot of conversations that are posed by the different, um, by where everything has been placed. So I'm curious to ask all of you, seeing your work, living with it here, um, the conversations that, that brought it to this point, how are you, what are some things that have kind of surfaced for you by being in conversation with one another? Don't be polite, just grab the mic. Okay. <laughs> Well, in this, I, uh, it's a joy to be part of this show, and it has been a joy working on it. It has felt like flowing and the whole process. And when, you know, I was thinking, you're in program, you're thinking, you have the conversations back and forth, but you don't know all of what's going around and what will come out. And uh, Maya was the last one to install her work. I had installed and then when I came and I saw all of these blues, I, I just was so happy with it because I felt that we were vibrating in the color field together. <laughs> and, and you know, knowing, just being here with Senga, that I also admire and have seen her work in different contexts and visiting these amazing museums and there is Senga with her world <laughs> and then going abroad and seeing her show and it's like, oh my God. Uh, and with Kim that we have known each other for a long time and being in these two parts of the building where you have your little paradise <laughs> there <laughs> and your pieces that you can eat them up, <laughs> just so body centered. So I feel, you know, with Suchitra that we have this exuberant and the textures and I'm looking at her piece and how it relates. So, I find this uh, sisterhood of conversations going. So I'm honored, as you said. Um, I think my first impression coming in, like Anna said, I was the last artist to install. And the first thing that really struck me was the feeling of the silhouette. I could really come in and sense the body um, in Senga's photographs, in Senga's, you know, installations, but also as um, sculptures, and I could, I kind of almost felt, and even the silhouettes of your ceramics and Suchitra's as well, I really felt sort of like a bodily reaction to the works, and I felt that that felt very cohesive throughout the show. That got me really excited to think about um, sort of, you know, who this work is for, uh, who this work is made for. Essentially, it's made for us. It's our personal stories, but somehow it still kind of coincides and overlaps in this more kind of organic and poetic way um, with the different materials that are up. So that was that was kind of what struck me the most. Oh. Um. So you're hitting on a, another note that I think is one of the most striking aspects for anyone who encounters this exhibition, which is the range of materials that are deployed by each of you. And, you know, some of them you want to just like run your hands over it, or at least that's what I want to do. Um, 
I think uh, with Suchitras, there's this back and forth between flatness and depth and two dimension and three dimension. Senga's works are obviously mostly wall based, but they allude to the body and obviously so many different materials. Maya's works, um, we were talking earlier about the blue tape and what that signifies, as well as so, so many other aspects of the materials that she's deployed. And Kim, of course, with, um, with the sculpture and the texture that you evoke and that you pull out from the material. I just, on a formal level, there's so much going on in here. Can you just speak a little bit to how and to what extent the material itself drives, inspires, motivates the work that you that you created here? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> If you don't, for a don't hesitate, just jump right in. So, uh, you know, for me, the pieces with the tool, it just, it, the tools enforce me, the shape. And I begin with an idea, kind of, I call these pieces tool paintings. And when I, when I paint, I begin, and I'm not sure where I'm going to end. Um, with the tool, because they are more concise in some ways, the moment I choose the colors, but I don't have all of them at the beginning. But then the, the last thing I do is finish the shape, and it's really the material that tells me how, I'm, how much push it this way or that other way. You know, when we sat, I'm looking at some of the pieces that they were barely at the studio much before they came here. So I'm still learning about them and I'm discovering little things, but it's, it's for me, it is the material and uh, like this piece when installing it, and I have installed it in other places all very different spaces. The first time was outside and how it was uh, just interacting with the storm and the wind and the rain and the night without the light. And, and here is so different. Uh, that first time, something, the piece became performative because Twice a day, I was taking a ladder and fluffing the cloud. <laughs> and here, it's the way it is since I installed it. Um, so it is truly the material. And I'm in love with this. It feels like the inks I use because they are transparent and this is transparent and I can play with the colors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm most familiar with Anna's work because we've known each other a while and I've seen you know, amazing uh, installations she's done in France and oh my gosh, it's like, it creates a story, it creates a fantasy. And um, with these pieces, um, I really am about the body and dance and so on. And there's, you know, this constant movement that's going on uh, with these pieces, and uh, it really is very energizing. There's a lot of energy in these pieces, uh, and if you choose, you can tell a story. And I, I love that this is tool, because if you use the word tool, this is a female tool, <laughs> you know, and, and it kind of, uh, you know, uses uses those feminine wiles in a sense. So that's what I get out of it. I, I'm sorry that I live in the Springs. It takes me a while when I was up here installing, the other pieces weren't here. So I apologize and I came in late. Um, so I, I'll have to look at it afterwards. So I don't have as much history with you all. And with my own work, um, I just uh, find what I can in the moment that uh, speaks to what I want to say. And when I look at the material, we have a conversation and then we work together and then something emerges that ideally is something that attracts 
who's looking at it and they too can be a part of, you know, what I'm doing. Thank you. Can you speak specifically about some of the water based worms that um, that are depicted? Uh, water based worms in the photo in, depicted in your photographs. Are there water based worms? Well, the bus Elliot and the water base. Is that what you meant? I mean, yeah, he's in a oh, he's tub. In a tub. <laughs> I don't know if that's water base because I do have water base uh, yeah. Uh That's of my husband who passed uh, a year ago. And okay. Oh, that's better. I can hear it's better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, he passed about a year ago, and and uh, that was a photo taken, you know, maybe seven or eight years ago. And um, I just wanted to honor him, and uh, it brought me into the realm of uh, photography. And I'm a sculptor uh, and uh, installation artist, but um, I'm really liking photography right now and it would really upset me that with photography you couldn't get that three-dimensional feeling and I always wanted to like somehow pull it out uh, and in this case I think I might have. I would agree, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yes. So. I, I just, is this on? No. Ah, good. I just wanted to say how moved I was actually when I got to see your photographs of your husband and, and also the whole installation set up in terms of a tethering that happens and his threads become kind of tether to to the to him into the world of the water and back out to us and and quite differently than how the tethers are are working in the other photographs where there's tension. Mm -hmm. This one is overlapped. Yeah. There's such a release that's in those photographs that I really appreciated. I just loved seeing this work and felt incredibly privileged to be able to just come in and see this work and know your work for so many years. And I feel a great privilege in being in this room with all of you and and Sikitra, but, um it's uh, one of the things I was thinking is, is color is, is used as a very powerful emotive um, um, tool as meaning and work in all of these artists. It's, um, that that it is, um, there's a potency in the way color is employed. But, so when you were talking about silhouette, my I totally agree, but then I was also thinking that it's, 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 this, it's contained with, you know, this color is contained within very powerful silhouettes. Um, just with regard to material, um, for me, ceramics is the material, the main material I've been working with for, for decades. And it's sort of everything to me. <laughs> you know, it's it's the ground, it's 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 the container, it's the body, it's the plant, it's the animal, it's 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 language, it's you know, earliest forms of language were written in clay and cuneiform. I mean it's just it is the history of humanness and humankind. Um, so when I'm working with that material, it feels like growing, growing the world and, and, and all the needs and, and um, um, struggles um, are part of the process, all the, the struggles we all um, have, but certainly the struggles of making things as large as these two. Um, but yeah, so, th so there's a, just a deep connection to the materi material that I've always had that I felt um, tremendously lucky and privileged and completely in love with um, from, from the first times I engaged it. And then glaze is this other sort of extraordinary thing which allows you to add this sort of layer of um, color and painting and, uh, and then it becomes like another whole uh, lived environment or patina. Um, as it's fired and it transforms and becomes a, a real thing in the world. So that's um, just a little bit about that. I think um, I think my question to you uh, is is language. Mm -hmm. So I think language, thinking about language as a material, 
and using sort of physical materials as a placeholder for the language is something that I like to challenge myself with. So kind of back to what Senka was saying, communicating and kind of being open to material to engage with you and accomplish for you is something that I really try to open my practice to. Um, and even in steel glyphs, uh, I started this series in 2016 when I was living in New York. The reason why I started working with that material, I was trained as a painter, and this is the first time I had, this time. I had made sculptures in a way. Um, I had just sort of by chance walked into a hole in the wall uh, welding shop next to my studio in Brooklyn, and I saw a big pile of discarded metal. And I was instantly drawn to it because I recognized it because um, similar types of designs and motifs, almost exactly actually, is used in Kathmandu where I grew up. So for me, that threw me in as a form of recognition. I knew what it was, I knew what it was used for. I understood it in the language. And so um, as soon as I picked it up, I knew that I had to use it. And so that became a whole series. Um, and then I went into storage in 2018, and I just got back <laughs> two months ago. And actually, I was supposed to, you know, the reason why it's all bound in blue tape was because I wanted to use it as a stencil to make paintings. Um, but once everything was wrapped in the tape in the studio, I just thought it was it. I, I like that the steel is uh, concealed. Um, there's a moment in which you recognize the shapes, maybe from sort of like past viewings of you know walking through a city or something, but it's still not completely obvious. And it takes a moment to realize that the tape is just blue tape. Um, and so I kind of liked. To I, so we changed the whole exhibition. Cecily and I, <laughs> I have to change the show. <laughs> so it ended up being different, but that's kind of how I approach the material. Is I just have to be very uh, organic in my process and true to myself. Well, it seems like that is a fairly common thread amongst all of you, which is to say to be led by the materials. I think for someone who has as linear of a brain as I do. I'm like, oh, you must know what you want, where you want to land, and then you just take the steps to get there. And of course, after all these years working with so many amazing artists, you would think I would have learned my lesson, but never is that the case. It is always about how the process, very much inspired by the materials, really drives, drives you to a place that you almost can't necessarily imagine. I mean, how beautiful is that, and how fortunate are we to be able to experience that on the other side? Um, I want to kind of shift uh, slightly to a different um, different topic, which is that um, the you know what brought us all together was this effort to shine a light on the incredible work from the uh, the creative uh, and brilliant artists in our community in Colorado, not specifically to Denver, of course, just across the state and. Um, I'm curious to hear from all of you, some of whom have been here for many years, some who are a bit more recently arrived in Colorado. To what extent does, how has, let's say, um, being here, you know, informed and impacted your practice on the one hand, and then also a little bit more specific to kind of the art ecosystem, how has Kind of being outside of those major centers of the art world also informed your practice. I'm going to jump in. Please. I'm, I'm, I, I was talking to Maya earlier. Um, both of us came here from New York, actually, Senka came here from New York too. And uh, I think the thing that was so extraordinary was this space. <laughs> there was so much space all of a sudden to work within. Um, and I, um, I think the other thing that was immediately uh, apparent to me was the, the incredible love and welcoming nature of the arts community in this region. They just opened their arms so fully when I moved here. I moved here in 99, and I was so moved by 
this incredible group of artists working in all media in all generations and and uh, and it's just been an incredible journey since then to to, to live and, and work and a privilege to live and work here um as an artist i i had the privilege of having a really lovely conversation with clark rickard i interviewed him for an article i was writing at one point and um and i asked him what place had to do with um the work that he made, or you know, what role does place have in the work that you make as an artist? Um, not in the meaning, but in the actual sort of visceral experience of place and how we understand it, how we work from it and out of it. And he spoke about the drama of the front range and how we're on this extraordinary um, stage, right? The plains, the flat plains meet this incredible outcropping of um, mountains and we're aware of this drama every day and then the light being so thin and this atmosphere is also incredibly dramatic which, which gives these incredible kinds of shadows and I think of silhouette too. Um, so I recognized that it had unconsciously in this conversation I reckon it had it had affected my interest in theatrical sets and trying to create that little literal theater set um, in the work that I was doing since I arrived here. And so um, you know that was one aspect that um, that I, I think about both the community and this miraculous landscape we're um, surrounded by. Um, as as tremendous influences. Okay. Um, yeah, I when I came to Colorado, uh, it was exciting that people accepted you for whatever you say. I mean, you could say you were a rocket scientist, and they would believe you. And I'm like, okay, I'm a rocket scientist. <laughs> but um, I liked it because, uh, and not in, in the actual meaning, but sort of, I liked it because I could be on the down low, and uh, nobody would know anything, you know. And uh, in New York, everybody's kind of looking over your shoulder. Uh, and and so this allowed me a particular freedom. So I'm in the Springs, which is a smaller city than Denver. And then Maya, I mean, she goes like, <laughs> you know, so she's an even the smaller uh, place, but it really allows a freedom of doing what you want to do. And there is nothing to my mind like. Uh, Pikes Peak. And if you get a chance, if you've not been down to the Springs, just experience Pikes Peak every single day. And I've been here 30 years, it looks different. And it's sort of my altar. You know, it truly looks different every day. And I am inspired by that. And I'm inspired by space too, although it's getting smaller with all the construction they're doing. But um, the, the, um, you know, the energy that, that is around here, the, the space is really wonderful and it does affect me. Yeah. And yeah, I think, that's really to that. I think um, I've been in Colorado for a few years now. I still feel like it's a fresh yeah. thing. Um, my memories of New York. But I think it's exactly that. You, you become uh, much less self conscious of an artist. To, um, which gives you the freedom to experiment and explore. And I think when you're amongst peers, it's such a tight, close, you know, unit or vicinity. Um, even if you don't want to like, start really considering, you know, uh, people's attention and feedback or perceptions. And for me, I think at one point that became quite suffocating to the art. And it started affecting the art in the way that I approached my work as well. So I think, you know, being kind of isolated now in the Salina, which is a very small town, um, and I had maybe had um, one studio <laughs> And I think that's, um, you know, a lot of things happen online. But physically, I've had probably one studio visit, and I actually think that's so awesome because <laughs> um, it just 
gives me so much more room to be myself in my own space and not have to clean up for someone or, you know, display my work for someone who's coming into the space. Like I can just unapologetically just do my thing. And that eventually really helps the work to flourish. And I've seen that happen before my eyes in just a very short amount of time in the years that I've been here. So, yeah, I think as artists, we're all geographically sensitive. Um, you know, we're all sensitive and spiritual beings that are using art as a tool to communicate. So, I think, you know, the spirit of Colorado specifically, I, I really love because, like you said, the elevation of mountains, but there's a certain energy that this space in the world that has, and I can really feel them, and I felt that it's just our family is here. And it really affected our work in my work. So. <laughs> okay, I, I do want to say this for all the artists that are out there that um, if you um, have something to say, and if you're passionate about it, then they will find you. When I first got here, uh, people said, oh, Colorado, you, you, nobody will see you there. You know, how are you going to get shows? How are you going to do this? They will find you. Trust me. They will find you. They found you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Awesome. But yeah, they, they found us. And, and so I would encourage you, even if you're in a location that's smaller, just keep the work up and they will find you. Uh, so I, I, I grew up in Buenos Aires in Argentina and we were talking before with Maya uh, um, about the sea and Colorado is the, play, the first place that doesn't have the sea. All the other places I lived, it's the the water was the the guiding point of where you were in the city. And when I said it's 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 big, it's many millions and tall buildings. And uh, and then I lived in other places, but. Colorado turns out is the place I have lived the longest. And when I moved here, I moved here, uh, I, I was in a very vulnerable place. I moved with my three small children. And uh, I moved, on one hand, I was needing a quiet. You know, as artists, we have, uh, we have our parabolic, have, you know, we, we, we have a radar and we pick up all of these different ideas. And I was needing to be in a place that was quiet, where I could hear my own ideas and learn more about who I was as an artist. And also, I found a very kind community where I didn't need to be this way or that way. I could flourish in my own way. I mean, that way, um, it was great. But also, I was amazed by the skies. The skies became the sea. And uh, my kids were very little. And at the beginning, you know, we would lay on the deck and look up at the skies and see the clouds. And it was like going to the movies. And the, 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 the light. Here it's, it has such a high vibrancy that I feel it accompanies me in the world. And as the years pass and you have opportunities to live in other places, I see how for me in every place I live, when I moved to the States, I just knew one person that was my husband at the time and then nobody else. So I felt so invisible, whoever I was in Argentina didn't exist here. So if I was in the States or not, it didn't really matter. So I really felt invisibility in a very body way. And each place I lived, I looked for a community. And when 
the community of Colorado and the community of artists in Colorado is so extraordinary how we help each other and what the institutions of art have been doing through the years and the collaboration that different institutions have been doing more and more. So that's how it feels just home <laughs> in a great warm way. Well, I think we have time for one more question and then is it okay to open it up to yeah. questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, so I think um, to just kind of take all of the incredible observations and um, offerings that you have all shared with regard to your work and really your practice at large, I'm curious um, what is percolating right now for each of you as a result of presenting this work, some of its new work, some of its work that is in conversation, you know, the existing work with some newer elements. What's percolating for you now in terms of what do you want to explore next? Where, where are you thinking about with regards to this specific um, project or something else that's totally unrelated? But how, how has the experience of being a part of this kind of Push, push forward or, or brought to the surface some new questions that you're thinking through. Um, so recently, I've been sort of going through new feelings. Um, after being, you know, a small town for three years, I think for the first time, I think I was feeling relaxed. And you know the the feeling that was like <laughs> <laughs> just feeling you know we're not on the move anymore. The find is settled. You know we're we're not on the go. So the sort of like the feeling of uh, kind of survival had sort of settled. And for me, the first thing I kind of started feeling was, wow, I'm in a small town. That's just prevalently white. <laughs> and it's weird. I didn't really, it didn't, I didn't, it didn't really bother me. I didn't think about it. Um, I was just kind of in my little cocoon making art. And really, kind of for the first time in the past months, I've really been feeling that. And I was almost surprised. I was almost like shocked by the feelings that I, that I was having. You know, coming from New York, where I'm surrounded by friends who look like me and being in a very diverse community. And, you know, I'm isolated here. And as much as I love that, now I'm starting to really kind of wanting a little bit more. So I think that's going to start coming into my work a little bit more. And I'm welcoming that feeling because, you know, this is America. So. I'm not going to pick up and go to another place. I'm going to sit here and, as an artist, welcome these feelings and tackle these uh, emotions as best way, best way I can, in the most honest way I can. I don't know how that will, how will look like, but it's just something that's been on my mind um, lately. That's beautiful. I can't wait to see what you make. <laughs> I um, it's funny because like what I proposed for this show um, to Cecily was completely different than what I ended up um making and and part of. Um, and I think this may maybe happened to a number of us. Um, but it was funny. I I you know I think you have to be where you are. Right? You have to land where you are. And I realized um. The work I wanted to, to show, I wanted it to have a kind of wistful kind of longing and that that wistful longing is really what I was experiencing was a place that is acknowledging the strangeness that I feel sometimes in our culture right now. And the, um, the pen, a little bit of that pending doom, <laughs> but at the same time, um, trying, trying to make a place that sort of also offered hope or a space that could hold us, that could hold that hope and that um, potential for um, uh, saving <laughs> that we need to, to kind of 
enact right now, very really enact this kind of act of saving. Um, so that was really what generated this remix of work, both new and old, for this, um, and trying to make these sort of very solo stages um, that were holding places or waiting places, refuges, um, but um, also sort of funny and, and um, hopefully kind of sweet in a way that like uh, <laughs> a good sweet thing makes you feel like you can exhale. Um, but this is probably, uh, I'm about to mount a totally different show, which is much more, um, I think, about what's missing and uh, a little bit more pointed to, to, um, to that end. So it, it takes a little darker time. Um, but this was what I wanted to show up with here. Um, so, in the way that I was talking before, I have many thoughts always and ideas and something that has been happening for me with the tool and before when we were talking about uh, materials and how they inform the other material that I find that informs me very much is the air around and the space um, and how that is um, an element to move through. So I find that when I'm working on these pieces, that is the other element that is happening for me. And with that, I see how I'm thinking more and more in pieces that um, are more performative and also the recognition that all of this work I couldn't do by myself and how inviting more and more the community to make these pieces uh, with me and, uh, and so on one hand I have this sense of this need of expansion um, I have my amazing assistants that are there, the work to be here without them, but it's this sense of a way bigger circle than just me. And with that, I feel um, how maybe I'm thinking of pieces with more performative elements. Also, when I was thinking about this work for here, um, I was feeling depleted, depleted, you know, I'm uh, tired and well, of course, you know, we all work a lot, we do a lot of things, but I was feeling depleted in this very deep way. Uh, we are now connected, we know of all tragedies that are happening all the time. We see um, with disappointments about ourselves and humanity and actions we take and, uh, as society. So, and we, we, we know all these things that are happening. So when I was working towards this show, I wanted to make work that would talk about the other part of what the, I was talking about the need of a newspaper of good news, how all of the things that we are all working towards, we care uh, as artists, as society, all this that we don't hear about. So I wanted to do pieces about that, about this deluge of good hearts that really are working hard to balance all of these targets. So these are things that I'm not thinking about. <laughs> um, I am thinking about uh, exploring photography, as I said, um, but I do have a secret. <laughs> I do have a secret. Okay. Um, everybody needs to wake up. 
And when I said I do have a secret, I hope you paid attention to your body. Because when someone says, I have a secret, all of a sudden you're energized. Yeah. All of a sudden your body moves. Yeah, <laughs> moves in a different way. And um, I'm always excited about that. I, my performances, my uh, audience participation um, really deals with that. Um, getting people to see things in a different way, awakening yourself. And I made some um, T-shirts that said, wow, on it. <laughs> and I wear them on occasion because when I wear them, when someone sees it, they say, wow. And they have to be participants in that moment. And so that's what I'm working towards. I love that. And can we sell those T-shirts? <laughs> Um, if it's all right, I'd like to open it up to our audience online and in person for maybe one or two questions. Um, if anyone has a question, just throw your hand up. Yes, and I'll repeat it so that everyone can hear. Thank you pretty loud. Um, I'm curious, like, how, like, what hobbies do you have that you're creating to close out your art and to other aspects of your life? <laughs> So the question was, what other, what hobbies do you have where your creativity flows out from your art practice into other aspects of your work? Um, <clears throat> I love drifting. So you, uh, what, you love what? Drifting. drifting. I thought you said drinking. Didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, I'm not no, no, drinking. Uh, I love drifting, and so <laughs> that's where I get a lot of inspiration. Actually, is going into thrift stores and looking at different things because, you know, I find different materials, and sometimes I find stuff. I'm just like, what the hell is this? And I have to research it. I have to think about the history of the object, think about the energy of the object, and I love interacting in that way with just unknown, unidentified objects. So that's like the first thing I. Think you said hobbies. I have a lot of other hobbies too, but mm -hmm. that's that's my favorite one. <laughs> well, it's fun. I, I have thrift too. It's actually dangerous. I know. Yeah, in Colorado, yeah, it's so crazy. Crazy. Yeah, so I want to go thrifting with you. I, <laughs> I do that too, but I call it treasure hunting. <laughs> um, I also have a lot of other hobbies. One of them is a little dangerous hobby. I'm just gardening, so yeah, every time it can take over your life. Um, but yeah, and other things, but that definitely informed. I think I grew up with a mother who was a very serious gardener and I grew up in a big family and realized that if I wanted to have any time with my mom, that I just had to kind of follow her in the garden. So um, I spent a lot of time with my knees bleeding and I guess I got a really great education in plant form from that experience, which has definitely inspired my work with that. I think we all probably, as you said, probably have a lot of different uh, things, yeah, hobbies. But, uh, and I don't know if you would consider this a hobby, but I really uh, like looking at rocks and picking up rocks and sort of like some people do it with clouds. You know, they have fantasies about clouds. Uh, I, I love the shape of rocks, big rocks, small rocks. And, uh, you know, just feeling them, uh, Thing, what they have to say. So I have piles of things I want to do that I never get to. So that uh, I'm already thinking, oh, I can make me, oh, if I do this or that. But those, they don't happen that much. And I'm, I'm a, a very intense person and probably a little obsessive, <laughs> but um, something that I find that I like a lot, but also helps me to unplug is to make puzzles. Uh, so it's a word that it's hard for me to pronounce, but it's the uh, putting pieces together. And then when I begin doing those, uh, I have to have it at the table where I don't do something else in that area. And it becomes this, well, I'm going to do one more piece. 
minutes and then I'll stop. <laughs> well, just one more. <laughs> I don't do it that often because sometimes I have to say, oh, if I have deadlines, I cannot do that because, yes, <laughs> I'll do the puzzle instead. That was a great question. Uh, one other, maybe final question. I don't know if there's any in the chat or anything. Okay, we're good. No chat. No chat. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so for young artists, which you all were or are, you know, depending on how you read me, what sort of advice do you have when you're new in your career? Like, what's something that you wish someone had told you when you first started? So the question was, what advice would you give to younger artists or artists who are maybe earlier on in their career? Something that maybe you you received or you wish you had received or or who knows, but <clears throat> something that I've experienced and I wish you know, other younger artists were experienced too is I think just notice the one or two people in your life that really support you in the work. It doesn't need a whole room of people. Sometimes it really just takes one or two people who really believe in you. And I've been blessed with that. And I think that really thrusted me forward into you know, doing what I do and continuing what I'm doing, even when I'm isolated in a small town. And it's the most encouraging feeling to know that this person, whether I'm in the room or not, they will be talking about me and they will be, um, you know, always be supporting me, even behind my back. And I think that's, but noticing that and recognizing that is also a big part of it, I think. That's lovely. Yeah. I think, I think we, it's, uh, there's this myth of community uh, that, that artists work in those isolated bubbles and we actually desperately need a community and 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 in fact much of our work actually happens in community and with community so um so that myth of solo artist i think is is true and i i definitely agree with maya that's incredibly important to cultivate that i'd say the other thing i would recommend is just really taking taking yourself and your work as seriously as you can never apologize for it cultivate your interest no matter how specific or seemingly trivial and and run with that be that enjoy it revel you know revel in it and, and um, see where it leads you so yeah. good question <clears throat> um There are a lot of very, very talented people in the world, and I have known many, and some stay the course, and some fall off for some reason or another because of obligations and so on and so forth. So it's a issue of you being committed, and as I said, staying the course, uh, you know, high, low, everything like that, and and. Uh, you know, make sure that your your heart is in it, and it will tell you where to. It's a practice. It's a practice. So, uh, you know, you're either in the practice or you're not. Uh, I heard a um, an interview last night. These these were musicians, and they said a curious thing that I had never thought of when they were talking about themselves. They said, uh, "We're lifers." <laughs> so, you know. You are or you aren't. I mean, you know, it can knock you off. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the art world. It's hard, you know, and you have to, you know, keep the passion in you of what you want to say and how you want to say it. It's really important. You know, your voice is important. So people will tell you this and that. Oh, no, I think you should do this. Well, I think you should do that. If if it's if it's an honest expression of how you feel, you have to stay with it. Yeah, I concur with all of that. And I would say 
perseverance because you always um, and honesty because you are working and your heart is in it and you're out there and you're vulnerable. You are out there with all these things that are vital to you. And then something comes or you're not accepted here or this doesn't come out the way you want it. And, and I say just perseverance. You know, it doesn't matter how many times we go down, it's how many times we go up. And, and also the myth of, uh, oh, you know, we get these inspirations. No, work, you know, doing art is about working. And it's just going to the gym, just every day you go, and you go to your studio, even when sometimes you don't know what you, you just go and it's work. You just work with it. Um, you, you don't think about retirement because you love what you do and you, you have universes of things, more things you want to do. So in that way, I think one of the worst enemies for artists is boredom. When you feel that something you are working on, the energy is just dissipating and going and you're bored, you need to move. That's telling you this is not the path. You, it's not about being entertained. It's just following that voice that tells you, oh, the energy is not there anymore. You need to move to what's true. Um, artists are scientists and what makes a scientist keep going is curiosity and discovery. If you can hold on to that and you know it won't be boring. <laughs> You'll be constantly inspired and and things will trigger for you and uh, yeah. Well, I can't imagine a better note to, to conclude this extremely um, inspiring and meaningful and truly special conversation with all of you. Um, I want to thank you so much for being so honest and uh, direct and candid, which is, I think, what people also value so much from, particularly from those who are um, already being so vulnerable and it's you know, sharing your work. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, and thank you to Cecily and to her team for enabling all of us to come together and be together in this really riveting conversation. It's been such an honor to sit with all of you up here um, and just thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you all. What an awesome talk. Thank you so much. And thank you, Nora, for leading the talk and bringing the questions and also bringing together these five incredible artists. It's been such an honor to work with all of you and such a joy. So um, I've been enjoying this exhibition so much, and this is such a great way to celebrate it. And we have so we have a few more events, too, if you want to come and get involved. Um, we have an art making uh, happy hour where we are going to be inspired by the works in the exhibition on October 11th, led by Katie Taft, our education manager, and she is so much fun. Um, and then on October 20th, there will be um, five MSU Denver dance majors who are spending the whole semester in the gallery getting to know this work intimately, and they are choreographing um, dance works based on the works in the show, and that will be performed on October 20th. So we would love to see you back. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. It was really great. Can we take a shot? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Take a shot. Great question. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Thanks. Wait, no. <laughs> <laughs>